Hey, Teresa, it's Spencer. Hi, Spencer. What's going on with you? Not much. Cooking spaghetti, listening to you. Just wanted to say hi to my husband, starting his shift at Fire Station 12. Well, let's hope he's listening. Thanks for that, Spencer. At first, I wasn't sure if this was a gay fireman joke or just lazy social justice writing, but then I remembered what year it was. Besides, if it's a gay fireman joke, it's been done. Fucking homos. Social justice writing really is like that asshole vaping theatrically in a bar. Hey, notice me. Pay attention while I vape. Oh, hey, what? why are you all looking over here? I'm just vaping, it's not a big deal or anything. So what does this have to do with Quantum Break? Two pieces of background writing completely ancillary to the story that are nonetheless shoehorned in with social justice themes. You've probably already decided to burn me in effigy for even saying this, but listen up. I don't disagree with the message. I don't give a fuck about vaping or who marries who, but it's lazy fucking writing and lazy fucking activism. You didn't carefully craft these characters to be this way, you're just following a trend and lazily flipping a bit in your normal mode of writing. Yes, I said normal, which is a statistics thing, not a moral judgment thing. It's like when you play a board game and the instructions were written by somebody who was painfully aware that most instruction manuals refer to the player or players as he, but some enterprising, brain-dead, hippie progressive has opted to use she and her instead. Never mind that that's almost definitely not an accurate way to describe most of your entire audience. No, you had an opportunity to lead by example and use gender-neutral pronouns to refer to gender-neutral hypothetical players. If it is a player's turn, they may roll the die to determine blah blah blah. You could have made it better, but instead you made it bad in a slightly different, ultimately inconsequential way. It comes across as petty and vindictive. The bigger complaint is that nobody talks like this. Nobody makes makes constant, fake, casual references to their significant other apropos of nothing. Earlier in the game, there's also an email from a female Monarch employee conspicuously name-dropping her wife and talking about how her ex-husband was supportive. That's nice, feel-good stuff, I guess, but it has no plot relevancy and it makes the game sound like it's pointing to these two gay married couples and saying, huh? Huh? We've got one of each. This kind of mandatory tokenism makes it seem like they were ticking off the checkboxes so that they could qualify as progressive. You were expecting me to be impressed by your progressive attitude just because you inserted some entirely plot irrelevant gay characters, but that's not how this works. If your reaction to what I've said so far is, why do you hate gay people, then I guess there's no point in talking to you. Why don't you support gay marriage? I do. I don't support bad, agenda-driven writing. Ayn Rand's books aren't bad because of Ayn Rand's philosophies. They're just bad books. It's just outrageously lazy that these are two characters defined entirely by their sexual preference. They have nothing else going on, they're just gay. Oh, that guy? He's gay. What else? Nothing. He's just... he's just gay. That's not a personality I'm fucking interested in. I hate to invite a positive comparison to Ubisoft's Deus Ex games, but I guess I have no choice. In DXMD, Jim Miller, Jensen's boss at Interpol, is a gay dude. Well, he's not really a dude, I guess he's a gay gentleman. Anyway, he's not always trying to steer the conversation in the direction of his home life, which is appropriate because you're involved in a lot of very important international intrigue during the game. Does it make sense that at some point Jensen and Miller probably talked about Miller's husband and kids? Sure. Maybe when Jensen was hired or on downtime between missions. But the way you find out that he's gay is when you break into his apartment to steal everything that isn't nailed down and gather intelligence while you're in there. It's fine, everything in the universe belongs to the PC. This kind of ham-fisted, lazy bullshit doesn't happen in DXMD. At least as far as I know, I got sick of the game way before I finished it, so I guess it could happen later in the story. My point is, nobody likes that guy. Nobody likes the gay person who won't shut up about how gay they are any more than they like the straight person who won't shut up about how straight they are. That can't be a personality! Think above the brain stem for a minute. It, could you? Our ability to do something other than what our lizard brain tells us to do is why we have a space program and monkeys still hurl their own feces. The point I'm laboriously trying to make is that I don't want writers to put this stuff in there because they think it's what gamers want to see. That's lazy pandering. And even if it serves a progressive agenda, it's still lazy pandering. It's no different than pandering to Christians or comic book fans or Americans or the Chinese. Write the characters you want to write and write the story you want to tell. This kind of stuff doesn't even ruin a game for me, unless it's omnipresent. Yes, Anthony Birch, I am looking at you. No, Borderlands the pre-sequel wasn't funny. Go back to making Rev Rants. Anyway, I fucking loved Quantum Break. I really should have played it earlier because it would have been one of my favorite games of 2016. I liked Quantum Break so much I 100%ed it, which isn't that much of a time investment since a single playthrough is about 12 hours and I managed to replay the whole game on hard to get the rest of the collectibles and make different choices in about 6 more. I'm not sure I can explain exactly why I love the game so much. The gameplay is pretty fucking terrible. What game genre is the Uncharted series? I wouldn't call them platformers because the platforming is almost automatic and there's only one route through the stages. 
I guess I'd call them navigation puzzle games. Basically, you're on a walking tour of some navigation puzzles that cater to the lobotomy outpatient ward. Calling these puzzles is kind of unkind to the word puzzle. Hmm, this scaffold just collapsed, but I need to use it to get to that ledge. Good thing I just unlocked the rewind time ability. I need to get through that door before it closes. Guess I could try this time stop ability I just learned. Other games have tried to be more creative with their time mechanics, like time shift, kind of, or blinks the time sweeper. Ultimately, it's no different than the so-called puzzles in any other puzzle game. You're not trying to use a collection of powers in a freeform way to navigate through an environment. You're just playing match the power to the obstacle. It's kind of like one of those toys with the different shaped blocks and holes, except you're only playing with one shape at a time. Every puzzle game is like this, it's just more obvious in a simple game like Quantum Break. The only true puzzle game is Rainbow Six Rogue Spear. Oh, that is a video for another time. Most of the game is walking around, listening to dialogue and interacting with story objects, punctuated by brief bouts of combat that sits on the border between perfunctory and terrible. So in other words, it's the sequel to Alan Wake, but unlike that game, the combat is too spastic to ever get truly boring. You have a good selection of powers, but the pace of combat is so rushed you can't experiment with them. There's usually a clear order to use your powers in to maximize your effectiveness. You should probably either play on easy to enjoy the time power sandbox such that it is, or play on hard for more of a challenge. My second playthrough on hard was way more fun, and I found I had to play more aggressively to keep pace. It still isn't going to make the gameplay segments groundbreaking or particularly impactful, but it does a better job of keeping you engaged when there's no story stuff happening. It did frustrate me that the game very quickly throws you up against enemies that you can't use your time powers against. The bread and butter time stop bubble becomes useless really quick, then the game turns into a more of a standard shooter, and as a standard shooter, it sucks noodle. The guns all suck too, and they've had any semblance of realism utterly hosed by game balance. Your basic pistol is a full-size Glock, but it only holds 8 shots. Oof. The heavy pistol is an FN57, a pistol famous for having a cavernous 20 round magazine. In game, it holds four. Ow, my brains! The two shotguns in the game are supposedly semi-automatic and fully automatic, respectively, despite being portrayed by the Keltec KSG and the UTAS-15, both of which are pump action. I'm not saying every game has to use real guns, but when you copy the design of a gun verbatim, you should at least try to make its function plausible. Also, I could swear to God the gun models in this game have lower poly counts than the guns in the original Max Payne. Otherwise, from a technical standpoint, Quantum Break knocks it out of the park. Like with Alan Wake, the graphics are ridiculously beautiful. The level design is dense and gorgeous with a masterful use of light and color. It's no wonder the game has no gameplay. It must have taken them years and millions of dollars to make the environments. It runs like shit on my computer, though. Time for a better graphics card. By default, the game upscales its graphics from a lower resolution. It probably does this on an Xbox One as well. Let's assume it was upscaling from 720p to 1080p. Then I played it on a 4K monitor, so it was upscaled again. If I tried to run the game in real 4K, I think my computer would catch on fire. There's a weird effect in the game where you can't seem to get the camera to focus on what you're looking at. You can't disable motion blur or depth of field, so pile that shit on top of the upscaling and everything seems blurry and jaggy as fuck. Alright, I really need a new graphics card. Anybody want to send me a 1070? The story is what made me love this game. I can't point to exactly why the story grabbed me, but it has to be a Sam Lake thing. I'm just immediately on board with Remedy Games. Quantum Break is about time travel, which is your cue to sigh heavily, and they wear out the phrase the end of time pretty thoroughly in the first hour. But it's actually a nuanced look at time travel. It's no primer, but because they took a relatively hard science approach to time travel, you get a closed loop story, which is always more interesting to think about than the fast and loose Terminator style of time travel. Watching the pieces of the story fall together is engaging and enjoyable. Each act of the game is punctuated with a live action episode of the Quantum Break TV show, which follows side characters during the events of the game. I think it's a great choice to keep the player character mostly out of the episodes. The episodes of the TV show are like a high budget Siffy original series or a low budget Siffy original film. They're surprisingly well produced and I ended up really liking basically every character in the game. In Quantum Break, you play as a grizzled dude with a leather jacket and time powers. No, not Max Payne. No, not Alan Wake either. His name is Jack. No, not Jack Mason or Jack... Actually, I'm going to cut this joke because it's too long. His name is Jack Joyce. Everybody is named Jack. And also, please don't alliterate character names. This isn't a story for kindergartners. The weakest link of the story, probably the only thing I didn't really care for, was that they had to shoehorn in narration over the top of it. I liked it in Max Payne and Alan Wake because it's something you don't see in games a lot and it was thematically appropriate. Max was the narrator of his own graphic novel. Alan Wake was, I think, writing a madness-fueled book about his own experience. 
But in order to have narration in Quantum Break, they had to use the worn-out cliché of the main character being interviewed after the events of the game. And of course, they're always coy enough not to spoil the plot of the game, even when it would make sense in response to a question. And even that was just a prelude to the bad stuff that would follow in that same place later. Oh, you vague booking motherfucker. The star power on display in the game is pretty impressive, but I'm not sure the right casting decisions were made for every character. I don't recognize the actor who plays Jack Joyce. I even looked him up, and it doesn't look like he's been in anything I've ever seen or will see. Still, he rocks the house. Do I look threatened to you? Lance Reddick is always awesome, and the guys who play Liam Burke and Charlie Wincott are really good. I was less impressed by Aidan Gillen and Dominic Monaghan as American scientists. They're both acting the shit out of this game, but neither of them does a very convincing American accent. Look, I've been tight-lifted about this for a reason. This project we've been working on is going to change the entire world. Uh... Eventually, I just stopped thinking of them as American, and aside from the accents, they're both excellent. Aidan Gillen portrays a very sympathetic villain, and I don't think the game's morally gray plot would work without performances this good. And I'm not just saying that because of name bias, either. You may be saying this sounds surprisingly positive about the game so far, but I'm gonna bring it back down for a minute. The gameplay in Quantum Break is so unimpressive that the game is almost not worth playing, but the story is worth experiencing, and since Let's Plays are cancer, the best way to experience it is by playing it. So there's that. I know it sounds like a weak recommendation, but I do think you should absolutely play this game if you've even slightly enjoyed Sam Lake's earlier writings. Is this game worth buying? Not for 60 bucks, no. Worth playing if you get it for a discount. A $60 game with, let's split the difference here, 12 hours or so of gameplay, I'd feel a bit shortchanged. It's weird, I'm happy to pay 20 bucks to eat popcorn and watch a two hour movie, but I expect a lot more from video games. Logically, you could say that games can build small pieces and then mix and remix them to create longer stretches of gameplay, but I'm not sure that's it. Regardless, I got the collector's edition of this game for 20 bucks on Amazon, and I'm happy to have it. 20 bucks is about the right price for the game, and I have a cool thing to put on my shelf. Also, if you have an Xbox One collecting dust, Quantum Break is something worth doing. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Oh, me? I'm just vaping. No big deal. I'm only vaping. It's really not a big deal. I know it looks like I'm smoking, but NBD, it's just vaping. Smoking is illegal indoors, so I'm obviously not doing that. Just vaping, which is really not a big deal. That cloud isn't smoke, it's vapor, for my vape pen. Vaping is normal, you guys. Sorry, Jensen, I have to take this call. It's my husband. Yeah, that's fine. Husband. Cough. I didn't ask for you to tell me this. My husband is the one calling me. Husband. I have a husband. I know. I broke into your apartment earlier. What?